Hey gamers, what's up? I hope you all had great holidays. I kind of failed to make an update video before the New Year's, but as you see, I'm back. And I'm still working on my NES survival game. So, what's new with it? Not a real change in the game, but I wanted to mention that I finally switched to Messen emulator for debugging purposes. I feel kind of ashamed that I haven't used it before. I guess I ignored it because I'm not a big fan of Microsoft and its frameworks. And basically Messen is a .NET application. If you're a Linux user like me, you will have to install Mono for it. Unfortunately, after installing the main Mono package, the emulator still didn't work on my system. Apparently all I needed was to install a Mono complete package additionally. With it, the emulator finally started working. And I have to say this emulator is something else. It is super accurate. I could even reproduce the exact glitches I got on real hardware when I had too much code in the non-maskable interrupt. Most importantly, Messen's debugging capabilities are really excellent. To be honest, I don't really need most of the features except one. While I was still using FCUX, I wished I could simply hit Ctrl F and find a particular subroutine or variable in my code. And it was impossible there. I wasted a lot of time by scrolling through tons of code. Luckily, Messen is capable of searching and it even has a list of all the subroutines. So even if I dislike .NET, I'm sold. Talking about .NET, I will mention another excellent application near the end of this video. Okay, if you saw my last video, you probably know that I've started making my own editor. So it was very tempting for me to try to load a CHR ROM with it. Because previously I had to export CHR tiles with NES screen tool so I could simply use them in my editor. If I would change my tiles, I would need to export them again. So my goal was to load the CHR and create an OpenGL texture from it. I kinda expected that the CHR format would be a, just a simple 2 bits per pixel bitmap. But apparently it was much more convoluted. Each tile is stored in pairs of 8 bytes. So after you read that pair, you need to combine the bits together to get the final result. That was a really interesting experience and I finally managed to load the CHR and I no longer need to export anything. Though my editor still doesn't support color palettes. So all the tiles have the same colors. It would be interesting to implement the palettes later but so far I don't really need them that much. So let's finally talk about the changes in the actual game. At this point all the items and NPCs were concentrated in the first screen of my world map. Because I had no clue how to make them appear and disappear while the map is scrolling. Apparently it wasn't that hard to do. All I needed was to add additional 8 bits to every object's X coordinate. Basically in these 8 bits I stored a screen index where this object is located. So to properly draw objects on the map I need to iterate through all the available objects and only work with those that are in the same screen as the player and with those that are in the next screen. Let's say I'm in the second screen, so the screen index is 1. I will need to take the objects with screen indexes 1 and 2. Now all is left is to subtract the scrolling value from the object's x coordinate. If the result is not negative, I can take that result and using it update the sprites in OAM. At first I wanted to spawn and despawn the objects in Jagaiden style. But then I realized that I have a lot of free RAM and I guess it won't hurt to store all the objects there because I don't really have that many. So currently all my items and NPCs are loaded to the RAM. So when I finally could scatter my items and NPCs all over the map, it was time to make the NPCs move. At first I implemented a basic horizontal movement in the single screen. Then the NPCs started traveling through several screens. The X coordinate was incremented gradually and when it reached 255 I incremented the screen index. The next step was for the NPCs to bounce off the edge of the world and move to the opposite direction. Then I thought maybe it's about time for the player to interact with the NPCs. And what's the better interaction than some mindless melee violence? 
For that I had to draw new frames for the player where he swings his weapon. I don't know what exactly it is, but I guess it's a knife of some kind, but not just an ordinary knife. That's a knife. It's a separate sprite by the way. The NPCs don't have hit points so far, so after one hit, they just disappear and spawn a meat item, which can be picked up by the player. So I no longer need to place meat items all over the map, the player can get them from the NPCs. I was afraid that it would be a pain in the butt to implement the NPC collision with the environment, since the collision map is kinda limited to the space around the player. But surprisingly everything just clicked. In order to prevent NPCs to get stuck in the walls, so to say, I made that the NPCs are inactive up until the player can see them. By the way, I have decided to replace the bear with werewolf, because all the snow doesn't match with bears that usually hibernate during the winter. And you know, the werewolf is a completely realistic beast. Another change to my toolset was ditching of this peculiar drawing program that I was using. All these apps of that kind are meant for the ROM hackers who modify existing games. There is no much point of using such program if you're making a game from a scratch. All you need is a tool that's capable of exporting a bitmap to the CHR. So you could edit that bitmap with a drawing program that's more capable. So now I'm drawing my tiles with GIMP. I drew some animation frames for the bunny and werewolf. The bunny animation was kinda tricky. I had to draw it twice. Because the first attempt didn't match the movement and it looked weird. While testing the game I noticed a strange bug that happens to the NPCs while they are moving. It was especially noticeable with werewolves since they are made of 6 sprites. Usually a 1 pixel gap would appear between those sprites. But it was appearing sporadically. What could possibly cause it? I tried to comment out the pieces of code, tried to revert to previous comments, but the bug didn't went away. Then I got a random thought. What if the sprite update subroutine is interrupted by the NMI and only a part of the NPC sprites is updated? Coordinates are transferred from the OM to the PPU. To be sure, I made that the sprites are transferred from the OM to the PPU only then when the sprite update subroutine is executed till the end. And I was correct. The strange gaps disappeared. Unfortunately, the sprites became super twitchy. Similar how they twitch in Ghost and Goblins, but way worse. So for now, I've decided that small random gaps in the NPCs are not a big deal. But I need to optimize the sprite update subroutine in the future. At that moment, I've noticed that I almost filled 16 kilobytes in the first PG ROM bank. So I was curious what will happen when this bank becomes full. So for that I created a game over screen. And I was quite surprised that nothing really happened when I added that screen to the ROM. So I continued working on the NPC's movement. At this point the movement was kind of boring. They just moved horizontally back and forth from one obstacle to another. So I've decided to add some randomness. I just copied the simple 8-bit LFSR code from my Atari 2600 game and what do you know, it just worked flawlessly and I could generate random directions for the NPCs. Basically I made that they would walk 16 pixels and after that they would get a new random direction. Also a new direction is generated when they hit an obstacle. The next goal was to make that the werewolves would be an actual danger to the player. Instead of a random direction, I had to assign a direction that points towards the player. When a werewolf reaches a player, it should do some damage. The first implementation was extremely bad because the NPCs could move either horizontally or vertically. So the NPC got stuck a lot and it not seemed that it could reach the player easily. The things improved a bit when I implemented the diagonal movement. While working I produced this funny bug by an accident. Current movement is still not perfect and I will be improving it. What's interesting, the hostile NPC does more damage to the player if that NPC is nearer to the beginning of the NPC list. Currently there were 
only five NPCs in total, but there was a significant difference in the damage rate when the hostile NPC was first in the list compared to when it was the last one. That shows how slow the CPU really is. Because I don't think that I do that many calculations for each NPC. So as I mentioned before, I had this game over screen in the ROM that did nothing. It was about time to make it functional. It should display how many days you've managed to survive. But there was no such thing as days in the game so far. So I added time. It's basically a sequence of variables that are incremented in every frame. Currently a single day in the game lasts about 8 minutes. Since there is not much to do, it's quite painful to wait through it. You just go out a couple of times, kill some bunnies, collect sticks, go back to tend the fire, until you notice that the new day finally has come. Now if you die in the game over screen, you will see that you survived for one day. I guess it would be awesome to make that the day night cycle would be visible in the game. Maybe I should modify pallets? Uh, but I guess that's a goal for the future. By the way, do you know why my previous attempt at making NES game failed? Back then I barely could code with 6502 assembly and I was following the Nerdy Knights tutorial. There was a group of articles in it about how to make music and sound effects and it involved making your sound engine. It seemed freaking complex. At that point I felt frustrated because I didn't want to write an engine. I knew I won't be able to write songs because I'm not a musician. Heck, I don't even listen to music. I just wanted to play some sound effects, that's all. This huge amount of work seemed so pointless, a waste of time and energy. So I gradually abandoned my project and never returned to it. Now I was about to repeat that process again. I didn't even plan to talk about audio processor and sound programming in this video. But somehow I discovered Famous Studio. A few months ago I found it on Google's Play Store and downloaded it to my phone. I loved how intuitive it was. Even a person like me who has no understanding of music can create something with it. Then I found out Famous Studio was a desktop application originally and it even had a sound engine that could be included into your NES game. Apparently it used a heavily modified Family Tracker 2. So let's open Family Studio. Yeah, it is also a .NET based app, so it needs mono on Linux. The UI looks pretty nice and clean though. The NES sound processor that is located in the CPU chip has 5 sound channels. And we can see them here. The one at the bottom, the DPCM, can play analog sound samples, but it is CPU hungry. So if you want to play, for instance, some voice samples, at that moment you can do anything else. In some songs it's used as a drum track. Can't tell more about it because I haven't tried it yet. Maybe I uncover more details in my future videos. The upper channel is a noise channel. It also can be used as a percussion track. Or you can play sound effects with it because it has all these bumps and hisses. The next one is triangle wave. It could be used as a bass. The remaining two channels can play square waves. Those can be used for the main melody and its chords. What's awesome, Pam Studio has some songs from games like DuckTales, Mega Man and Castlevania, so we can open them up and see how they are made. So for your game you can export your song as a assembly code file. Pam Studio supports three different assemblers. Also we can create a sound effect library with it as well. It is pretty easy to include the Famous Studios sound engine into your game. All you have to do is to include the main Famous Studio file in your exported song. Tweak the Famous Studio file, change the settings, specify where your RAM and the zero pages, and then you need to initialize your song and run the 
play subroutine. What is left to do is to run the update subroutine in every frame. You can put it in the LMI if you have free CPU cycles. And after building your game, you can finally hear your song playing without any understanding how really the audio processor works and what memory addresses were used. I'm not sure how I feel about it. On one hand, I don't like that I lack the knowledge about the hardware and how it works, but at the same time, I'm kind of happy that I have this free time from toying with hardware that I can spend improving the actual game and maybe writing a better song. What can I say? Fam Studio is awesome. It's kind of hard to believe that it's completely free. So now I have this crappy tune and several sound effects playing. As I said, now I have the opportunity to improve my game without spending time coding the sound engine. So I still have 11 kilobytes free in the PRG ROM, so I need to spend them wisely to make the game fun. My next goals will be probably to randomize animal spawns every time I leave the house, because it is boring to see the same bunnies and werewolves at the same spots. Also I need to improve the bunny AI, so they would try to run away from me. I might need to add sleep mechanics as well, since we have this bed in the house that's almost unused. In fact there is so much that I can do and add that I'm not even sure if I will be able to fit everything in those remaining 11 kilobytes. I guess as always you will find out how it went in my next video. So if you're interested in my struggle then please subscribe the channel and don't forget to hit the bell icon. As usual you can find the games ROM and the source code on github. The links are in the description. So thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.